appreciate the opportunity to uh, share this content and uh, be a part of the accelerator. And I really appreciate the work that everyone at the accelerator is doing. So thanks for that. Uh, with that, I'll share my screen and get this presentation underway. Okay. And I'm guessing everyone can see this. Thumbs up. Great. All right. So, um, you know, I've just got introduced, so I don't think I have to rehash things uh, too much here, uh, other than to say that, you know, our company here is in Portland, Oregon, um, and, you know, we're focusing on zero energy and passive house buildings and recently have started uh, really paying attention not just to the embodied carbon uh, in the buildings, which we're going to touch on with the concrete free slab, but also just retrofits and uh, trying to decarbonize the built environment. So um, those are our main focuses here. Um, I'll do my best for those Canadians in the crowd to, if it comes up to speak and you know, let you know if I'm speaking Fahrenheit or Celsius, those kinds of things. Um, and I, yeah, please ask questions and um, I'd be happy to answer them at the end of the, uh, the presentation. So with that, let me forward the screen here, if it will. There we go. Um, so concrete has huge environmental impacts, right? So, you know, it's, it itself, that one material contributes 8% of the total greenhouse gas emissions on the planet, right? Just this one material. So, um, and also cement, if it was a country, it would be the third largest emitter in the world, just this one material. And it's also the most used material on earth uh, behind water. So, as you can see during the manufacturing process here, this is from McKinsey and Company, you know, you have to go all the way back to the quarry where you're grabbing these raw materials, transporting them to the crusher, to the raw mill. And then you can see where it's highlighted here in the middle. This is uh, where most of the greenhouse gas emissions are coming from. So we're using fossil fuels to create really high temperatures to create this clinker, to create the cement that's being used. So this one material really has outsized uh, embodied carbon. Um, and so obviously we're trying to use less of this in our buildings. Um, so another thing that people don't tend to think about or you hear, you hear often about these stats about it's 8% or you know, it's uh, got all this high embodied carbon, but um, you know, the sand that's used in concrete has also got huge impacts. This was a documentary, I believe it was in uh, National Geographic about these sand mafias. And you know, it gets into like, um, you know, these, these illegal networks, right, that, that have resulted in violent conflicts. Um, you know, these people will threaten whistleblowers, they'll bribe local politicians and law enforcement officers. Um, there's been hundreds of murders in the past few years, all around extracting sand. And that's before we even talk about, you know, the environmental impacts of extracting the sand too. So it's the largest extractive industry in the world is sand. And this has huge impacts on river deltas, lakes, and beaches, and all the destruction that comes along with that. So uh, desert sand doesn't work for concrete. It's too round. We need to have more cubic sand, and this is where you tend to find it in these river deltas. So uh, embodied carbon, social, all these impacts, right? So this chart in the middle is one that I always start my presentations off with. So, you know, buildings account for about 39% of all the greenhouse gas emissions on the planet. Uh, the materials and construction account for 11% of that. So, you know, concrete is also, besides this impact that it has on the operational embodied carbon, uh, it's a good conductor of energy. So when we're looking at slabs, which is the focus of this talk, um, most of the losses that are happening from inside that building are happening through that slab edge because it's just a good conductor, right? So we're losing our energy from that slab, but we're also getting comfort impacts too, right? So, you know, if it's cold or hot outside, we're going to reflect that into the building and affect our occupants too. So uh, typically the concrete in a home's foundation uh, has more embodied carbon than the rest of the house and all the items that you put inside of that house. So we really want to pay attention to reducing the amount of the stuff that we can. It's, a, it's obviously a very useful product, right? So, you know, you, one has to kind of ask themselves, like, what's, what is this concrete slab doing uh, in our building, right? Um, you know, this is kind of a, a joke here where there's the two types of concrete. There's concrete that's cracked, and then there's the concrete that's not cracked yet. Um, but 
beyond that, like as far as we can tell, the main point of the concrete and slab is just to for us to stand on and for us to put things on. You know, typically for most residential projects, it's non-structural. Certainly when you get into larger multi multifamily and commercial buildings and you have post-tension slabs and things like that, it does become a structural element. But in many buildings, it's simply just something to put something on, right? Put your stuff on or to stand on. And um, another thing about it too, is that it's difficult to install flooring over concrete, right? We wanna make sure, you know, as it's curing, it releases a lot of moisture. Um, if you're gonna do it successfully, you wanna make sure you have a good vapor barrier below it. And then you wanna make sure that you're ideally coating it with some sort of uh, liquid applied, applied like epoxy or something, a vapor barrier on top of it before you put on your battens and your, and your finished flooring. So it's a complicated thing to put flooring on top of. Um, you know, slabs are also, they're, they're rarely level or plain if you really get down to it. Um, they take concrete, has specialized equipment and subs. Um, it's fairly expensive, especially in today's market. Um, and if you need repairs, uh, it's really difficult to cut concrete out and remove it and then replace it. So um, we kind of just started asking ourselves, well, what's the, the point of all this, right? So what do all successful slab on grades have? They've got five basic layers, right? So first of all, there's the native undisturbed soils. We want to put our houses on good stable soils. Um, two is the, the gravel that gets laid down. And this is a capillary break to stop that bulk water from being wicked up into our buildings. And it's also a soil gas depressurization field. So this is what would collect all the radon gases and stuff like that. So they can be safely you know, exited from the building. Uh, on top of that, typically you've got an insulation layer. Um, you wanna, again, make it comfortable. Um, then you have your vapor barrier. We wanna be able to stop that vapor drive from the ground, which is typically at 100% relative humidity, no matter where you are on the planet, from our buildings, which is typically less than 100% or hopefully less than 100% relative humidity inside your building. Um, and then on top of that, you've got your slab, right? Your standing surface. And this is the part that you know has that potential for some impact, right? Is to replace that concrete. So uh, introducing the concrete free slab on grade. Um, this is just a cross section of a project that we, uh, we've done a couple of now where we've used ICFs as our stem wall. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to share these slides too. I can uh, put a link into the accelerator to get these out. Happy to open source these things if people are interested. Um, but as you can see, all five layers are present. There's really not much difference in the first four layers. Um, and then above that for the slab itself, we've simply got two cross laminated pieces of uh, three quarter inch plywood. And then on top of that, our finished flooring. So that's the, the main difference here. So this is a, a great illustration that was done in Fine Home Building Magazine about this particular ICF concrete free slab on grade that we did. Um, I did give this link um, to Shannon and she could put that up on the, uh, on the chat uh, to check out this article in Fine Home Building Magazine. But again, here you can see where we've got the, the native soils, our gravel, our insulation layers, our vapor barrier, and then the plywood, um, and then the finished flooring over the top of that. So it's, it's a fairly simple uh, thing. So I thought what I'd do is just kind of take you, know, you through step-by-step step with some photos of, of an actual project that we uh, completed. Uh, we've done, uh, I think, three, and we're currently working on our fourth um, concrete free slab on grade project. So um, the first one's pretty straightforward here. There's, there's no real difference here. Uh, you excavate down, uh, throw down your gravel, compact it, and get it ready for your footings and your stem walls, right? So um, the next step here is you're going to set your uh, forms, uh, pour your foundation walls, and, and then backfill. Um, again, fairly typical. In this case, what we're showing here are some ICFs that we used. Um, and then what we do is we fill that, um, the interior part of this foundation with our three quarter inch gravel. Um, you wanna use gravel with no fines in it. Again, you want this to be something that will not get clogged up and, and you know, wick water up. So you wanna make it a capillary break. Um, and, and that's it. There's really not much difference here compared to a regular stem wall and footing so far. So 
Um, here's where it gets a, a, a little bit different. So what we're going to, on a typical slab, you get to the point where you'd have your gravel in there. Then you would set your insulation, your vapor barrier, and pour your concrete. Now, with the concrete free slab on grade, we can't really put our vapor barrier down and then start framing because what if it rains? Uh, we're going to end up with the giant pool of water, right? That's bad. Um, whereas if it was a concrete slab, it would just run right off. It just, it, it's a moot point, right? So we have to do things in slightly different order, right? So uh, we end up framing our walls and our roofs and we dry the building out um, before we install our slab or before we even install anything, any of the insulation or vapor barriers or anything like that. So it's, it's a little bit uh, out of order. Um, but what it does mean is when you do get this thing stood up and, and insulated or uh, dried out rather, um, when you're completing the rest of the slab, you're working indoors, which in Portland, Oregon, it's quite rainy here. Uh, winters are cold, summers are hot. Uh, it's, it's fairly pleasant to be working indoors when you're working on that slab. So the next step is to install your sub slab plumbing and all that groundwork plumbing and stuff like that. So uh, what we did on this particular project is we had that three quarter inch gravel and then we threw some quarter minus gravel on top of that. Um, this was due to timing. Uh, in the future, uh, I would hold off on that quarter inch gravel uh, because when the plumber came through, he started digging his trenches for his plumbing and he had to make piles. You can kind of see on the right hand photo in the back, we got some, we piled up the quarter minus gravel to keep it separate from the three quarter gravel. Um, you know, but anyways, point being is it's pretty easy for your plumbers to work in this stuff. They can scooch it out of the way pretty easily, set in all that plumbing. Then you replace your three quarter inch and then put the quarter minus back over the top. Um, one thing you do want to pay attention to is making sure that you get your plumbing lines far enough down that they're not going to rise up above this gravel layer. And I'm going to show you a picture of where that happened in one of our projects. And this is one of those, um, let me fail first and uh, take that punch and then and show you guys so you can avoid it yourselves. So um, the next uh, step is you, you get that quarter minus gravel down and you screed it out. Um, we simply just shot a laser um, as a reference, measure down, and you screed it out with just a, a typical two by four. You can see uh, Fidel and Evan here on the right um, going through leveling that out and then throwing down uh, the first layer of foam. Um, so on the left, I've got a red arrow here kind of showing where those plumbing pipes could have been a little bit deeper, right? So what that meant was when we got to installing that layer of foam, we had to carve around those things which did take um, extra time and, and labor and stuff like that. So something to avoid. Uh, on this particular project, we're using a, a GPS foam. So this is the graphite impregnated EPS foam. Um, you know, we're using EPS on the current project because you can't get GPS now. Um, one could use XPS. Typically our structural engineers, the foam rating that you're gonna get with like a type one foam is plenty fine for the loads that you're going to see inside of a residential building. So you don't have to do anything crazy with the, the foam or the density of it or anything like that. So as we go through, you know, we, we offset um, our panels. So we're running these uh, foam sheets perpendicular to one another and then offset from one another too, so that we can break those, uh, those lines. So we're not getting any thermal bridging up through those gaps between the, the foam. Um, this is all pretty easy. You can see that we've got our windows installed, the roof is on. Um, you know, it was a pretty rainy time when we were installing this project, so it was nice for the team to be inside uh, when we were doing it. Uh, you can see on the right where we've had to carve out some of that foam for that plumbing again. And uh, next, um, they're on your first layer of plywood, right? So we have used in the past just regular CDX plywood. Uh, and we've also used the tongue and groove version of the CDX plywood. And uh, in the end, the, they both performed well, but we noticed that the tongue and groove kind of had a little more rigidity on the floor. Um, and we're gonna stick with that in the future, even though it's a little more difficult to install, um, it's not that much more difficult and we think the benefits are worth it. So, um, you know, we've done both. I, 
I would have no problem doing either or, but we tend to go for that T and G just because it gives it a little more uh, rigidity uh, with that. So because it is wood and it's floating, um, you know, we should back up a little bit. You know, once we get our um, foam installed, we then install our vapor barrier and make sure we tape all those seams, right? Um, what our team does is we take a flap, like 12 inches of that product, the typically a 10 mil polyethylene sheet, and we put that below our mud sill. Um, and then that on the exterior, that connects to our air barrier, goes below the mud sill. And then on the interior, we just tape it to the field vapor barrier in there. So we have a completely continuous air barrier that travels under that mud sill and then connects to the sheathing, which is our air barrier in this case. So um, really easy to throw down that 12 inch stripe of polyethylene. Um, and rolling out the polyethylene in the field is, is easy too. So uh, next you're gonna install your second layer of plywood. Um, so what we do here is we um, get some construction adhesive, lay that down, and then we install uh, the sheet again, perpendicular to the lower layer and offset at those seams to give it the most rigidity. Um, and then we screw it together with inch and a quarter screws. So we've got two three quarter inch layers of plywood, that's an inch and a half, and we throw down those inch and a quarter screws because we don't want to go through there and puncture our, our vapor barrier. Um, if there were a few screws that punctured through here and there, um, I really wouldn't be too concerned. You know, a little bit of vapor coming in from the ground and a few holes really isn't going to be that big of a deal. There's not a lot of air movement going through the ground. Um, but clearly, if you can avoid it, avoid it. And it's pretty easy to do. So um, this is just uh, a, a kind of a, a photo in progress here. Um, in this particular case, this is a different project where the windows were delayed due to market uh, reasons. Uh, and, but we went ahead and started installing this anyways, and it really wasn't much of a problem. We didn't get enough rain that it um, filled up uh, our house and created a bathtub. Um, the, the arrow I'm showing here is pointing to these little kick plates. Um, as we were installing our second layer of plywood and using kind of like a big uh, sledge to kind of bang it together, it shifted the lower layer of plywood as it was doing that. So what we did is we put down that first layer, for second layer, excuse me, of plywood over the first. And then we just took some scrap plywood, two buys, and then nailed it to the mud sill and then to that first layer so that when we were putting the subsequent layers down and smacking it in with our sledgehammers, it didn't shift it and move it. Um, so easy enough to do, quick little tip. Um, you can see too that we've given a little bit of a gap between the edge of the plywood and the wall itself of the insulation. Because it's wood, it will expand uh, and contract. So we give it at least a half inch, ideally three quarters of an inch from the edge so that it can move and expand and contract without um, buckling or anything like that. So um, once that's installed, it's time to um, frame your interior wall. So it's, uh, you know, again, a little bit out of order. Um, you know, none of the walls in this particular project were load bearing. Um, you know, if there were, we'd have to run probably a stem wall and a footing through the interior of the building. Um, and then detail around that. But in this case, um, there were no structural interior walls. So we just go ahead and start uh, framing them up uh, afterwards. Um, on that bottom plate, uh, when we're nailing that in, uh, we're using two and a half inch nails. Again, you've got an inch and a half for that bottom plate and an inch and a half of built up plywood. So you wouldn't want to use a three inch nail or a three and a half inch nail because you would go all the way through. So, um, just shorten up your nails there, not too big of a deal. Um, and then lastly, uh, start installing your finishes. Um, you know, really it's no different at this point than installing uh, something on a, just a typical wood frame floor. Um, so not too big of a deal. Um, one thing that you do wanna pay attention to um, is because it is a wood floor and it's on grade, you want to make sure you're not creating some sort of vapor sandwich, right? We want to be able to make sure that we're paying attention to the permeability of the products that we're putting on top of our wood slab. And so we want to make sure that they are vapor permeable so that if you do get the occasional spill, 
or overflow or something like that, that that water won't get trapped in there and you know create havoc uh, in that assembly. And so we're looking for a permeable flooring. And interestingly, originally we found this bamboo uh, engineered flooring and um, it turned out that once we kind of started, well, first of all, no flooring manufacturer has any idea what the permeability of their product is, or at least none that we reached out to. It's not something that they typically declare on their products. Um, so it is hard to find, you know, permeability of specific flooring products. So it can be tricky, um, but some flooring manufacturers are willing to work with you. Uh, we did find a bamboo that looked great. It was a green certified eco product, whatever it was, but it turned out it had like a real thin layer of plastic sheeting going across one of, one of the layers. Um, luckily, we discovered this uh, before we laid it down and we're able to switch it out with the clients and use something really similar. So, uh, you know, a, a dimensional natural wood an engineered wood or something like that, a cork, a marmoleum, all these things are good. They're all permeable, but you're definitely gonna wanna pay attention on some of these products that can get a little bit tricky. Again, you wouldn't want to um, trap moisture, you know, more so than that plywood has an ability to dry, right? So, um, you know, this is the, the finished product here, um, you know, no different than a, a regular floor. It's great to install. Um, you know, if we go back here on the bottom right, you can see the gang is just um, using your typical flooring install, you know, nail guns and all that stuff. They didn't really know the difference, um, just mailed it in. Um, and, you know, when you're walking on these floors, um, it has a gift to it. You know, when you stand on a concrete slab, it's hard. You know, that'll get people's knees over time. It's not super pleasant uh, to be on for a long time. These, they don't, uh, they don't squish. Uh, they, it's, it's a similar experience to like a wood framed floor, maybe a little bit softer, um, which our clients who in this case were, um, gosh, they were probably in their 60s, really enjoyed and have really enjoyed since. It's just got a little bit more of a give to the floor um, because it is a floating assembly. All right. So things to pay attention to, um, bathrooms and wet rooms, you know, people will choose tile typically in these locations. Um, oftentimes that tile is not vapor permeable. Um, and in this particular case, we had a client decide to do a threshold free shower after we had started the assembly. And then we were really left scratching our heads. Well, how do we do a threshold free floating plywood and get the you know tile set and all this stuff. So we actually had to retrofit it where we cut it out. Um, and it's a lot easier to cut out plywood than you know four inches of concrete, right? So grab the saws, cut it out, um, you know, removed a layer of foam, uh, dropped it down a little bit, reinstalled our vapor barrier and poured a mud set pan over the top of that. So it worked out pretty well. Um, one thing you're gonna to wanna to do is use a decoupling membrane if you're putting tile over this because the floor is floating, it does have a little bit of give. And so you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're decoupling that movement from the floor and the tile so that you don't get broken grout lines and stuff like that. So definitely wanna throw down that decoupling membrane, which by the way, is not vapor permeable. Um, this is just a plastic product, right? Um, but you know, as long as there's adjacent areas for that wood to dry to, should it get wet, we're not really too concerned. Um, you know, there's the storage capacity of materials. We have to be able to allow our materials, if they get wet, the ability to retain moisture without damage and be able to dry. Now, I probably wouldn't put, you know, a decoupling membrane or an impermeable flooring over the entirety of the whole slab but we feel comfortable doing it just in a wet room or something like that, knowing that there's adjacent areas next to where that can dry to. So, um, I wanna be realistic here. Um, there are challenges. You know, one of the things that the carpenters learned real quick um, was you can't just throw down your framing lumber and frame off the ground anymore because you're working off of gravel, right? And so we ended up, basically having to build, got these little sawhorses, as you can see on the right, um, where we built the walls off of before we stood them up. So, you know, took a little extra time, a uh, little extra 
hassle uh, to do, but not the end of the world. And the team was actually able to be pretty efficient on these builds. Um, another thing we learned, a uh, current project we're working on, it's got a moderate slope. And so it dropped maybe two and a half, three feet from the highest point of the house to the lowest. And uh, as we excavated that and set our forms and did the concrete, we then had to fill that back up with gravel. And it did use a lot of gravel. We had to truck in quite a bit. Um, and that was a, a pretty good expense for that. And, you know, the team was like, well, is this really that much better than a, you know, if we were to hung, hang a, um, a wood framed wall off of that? Um, but in the end, we think it still made more sense from a building science and, and thermal perspective uh, than some of the origami that you'd have to do with a wood framed uh, wall, like a, like a conditioned crawl or something like that. Um, not to mention the cool thing about slab on grade is that they're really accessible. Um, this particular house we're building is for an older couple and her, one of their sisters is in a wheelchair. And so we're, this is all ADA. And the nice thing about slab on grade is they're not raised up like a typical crawl would be. So there are certainly benefits to it, but um, it, we did spend some money on that gravel and it's a little bit different. Um, also, you know, as we're raising up walls, uh, you have to set up your uh, wall jacks to keep everything plumb. And we ended up just kind of driving stakes into the gravel. Uh, typically, this would just get nailed off on your wood deck. Um, but not the end of the world, just but something to pay attention to. So, um, so the project I, I showed um, was an ICF uh, stem wall. And the current project that we're working on, we kind of had an epiphany was, well, hey, why not, if we can skip the ICFs and not have that, you know, plastic in the ground too, wouldn't that be all the better? And so what we did is we did a typical footing and stem wall, and we did a knockout with just a two by six on the top of the stem wall, and then filled that with our, our foam in there, and then attached our, our uh, sub slab foam to that and then had exterior insulation on the wall, the framed wall, and then dense pack cellulose in the framed wall. And uh, this actually works so that we can avoid exterior insulation on the outside of the stem wall, which is a headache, really. I mean, do you put it in while you're pouring the concrete? Do you put it on after? How do you hold it in there? What's the embodied carbon of that particular material? You know, what kind of protection board are you putting over the top of it? And all those expenses are really avoided. Um, we ended up doing a, a therm model on this. Um, and so it works, as you can see here. Um, if you look at the temperature gradient, we're staying at 66.6 .6 kind of evil degrees uh, on the inside here. Um, but in Portland, Oregon, on a design degree day, I want to say it was 14 degrees, I think is what they punched in on this one. Um, you know, it's still staying uh, warm on the interior and we're, there's no risk of condensation or mold at that critical junction right there. So it works. We were able to enter the psi value into our Woofy passive model and uh, it barely moved the needle. So um, really cool way to avoid that extra embodied carbon, the extra labor and steps there. So here's a picture of that uh, exact assembly here. Um, we, again, we take that little 12 inch rip of um, polyethylene under our bottom plate. We still put the sill seal on there. And then we attach our uh, mud sill to that. Um, on the exterior, um, we actually set our mud sill in a half inch into the building so that when we put on our sheathing, it's in the same plane as the concrete. And then what that allows us to do is to take a piece of tape, you know, like a Sega Fentrum or something like that, attach that to the concrete, it bonds to that uh, green vapor barrier, air barrier, and to the plywood, which is our primary air barrier there. So um, really secure, good air barrier connection there um, and, and easy to do, really. So. so some of the fringe benefits of the concrete free slab on grade, right? Um, you know, it removes delays due to the busy trades, right? So if you're, you know, you, if you're waiting on your concrete sub, uh, or you're waiting for the, the concrete truck to show up or any of those things, suddenly you don't have to worry about that. This is all under your purview as a contractor, right? You can schedule your team to work, start framing as soon as you're ready and not have to rely on others, right? Um, 
The fact that it's done in-house, here's a little picture of our team, um, means that we actually have a higher margin on work that's performed in-house than is subbed out. So financially for us, we're either able to lower the cost to our clients or we're able to make more money or you know, use that as a buffer for other parts of that project, right? So it's just more cost effective. Um, and it also is just compared to a concrete slab, it's more comfortable. Um, and that's what your clients are really gonna you know, let you know <laughs> if it's not comfortable. Having that plywood underfoot underneath all that insulation, um, you know, even if you have concrete that's at 70 degrees, it still feels cold to the touch. And, you know, having the wood floors is a nicer experience. So, yeah, you know, I, I get lots of people that think this is crazy and they come up with all sorts of reasons why it won't work, right? But, you know, what if you get a, what if you get a flood? What if your water heater explodes or your, you know, your kid leaves the faucet on and overnight or who knows what but what i'll say to that is like well what if you had a concrete slab on grade and you had your wood floors over it and you had a flood well that's a real hassle to deal with um with the slab on grade anyways right i mean floods are bad even with concrete right you still have to replace all the sheetrock that got damaged and all that and i'll make an argument that to replace you know, the concrete is hard, but if you have to replace the plywood, let's say there's a leak or you have to access a broken plumbing line below this thing, you just grab your saw, you cut out a, a square, and then you cut out a smaller square and you can access the thing, put your smaller square back, glue it, put your bigger square back and walk away. Um, you can do that in less than an hour with typical tools versus having to break out concrete and cut it and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, the other question I get to is like, that can't possibly support all the loads inside of a house. Um, you know, this is the trans Alaskan highway where they actually are supporting uh, a road. Uh, you know, uh, lots, lots of airports are built with this geo foam. Um, there's really no issue from a structural perspective, uh, with using foam when it comes to loads. All right. Um, Another common thing I get is, well, what about bugs, critters, all that kind of stuff? Um, this is a typical, I just took a screenshot of a, of a typical termite, you know, resistant assembly. No reason you couldn't do the same thing, right? Keep your wood siding eight inches above grade, make a metal termite shield at that mud sill, use your gutters and downspouts, keep it dry, treat your soil for termites, remove all the flora and stuff from around your house to keep the bugs away from it. Um, you can do all this, right, to keep the bugs out. Um, and typically bugs aren't super interested in things in, in dry wood, they like moist wood. And if you're doing it right, you really, there's no reason that plywood should ever be moist, right? Um, and, you know, maybe this isn't for everything. I mean, if you're really in termite land and there's nothing you can do about it, maybe the concrete free slab on grade isn't the best foundation for you. Maybe you should be using piers and setting it up off the ground. Maybe you should do a full basement. Maybe you should do a regular crawl, right? So I'm not gonna say it's, it works for every single scenario, but we're certainly not super concerned about the, the, the bugs and vermin and stuff like that. So, you know, we touched on this a little bit, you know, the, floor, the floors are warm, uh, they're forgiving, they're comfortable. Um, so um, doors and thresholds, and we're trying to make those, you know, uh, thermally broken from the outside. It's actually really nice and easy with this because you can just connect your, your thermal layer really well. Um, and there's just less thermal bridges with this particular thing. So there's less opportunity for mold growth and poor under air quality and that kind of stuff. So um, then I'll say, don't just stop there, right? I mean, we got rid of all that concrete that was in that slab but we still have concrete where we have our stem wall and footing, right? So this is uh, our current project. We're working with the Oregon DEQ uh, on a new slab blend where we're using some slag in here. And uh, we're able to knock down the embodied carbon in that concrete by 50, 50%, right? So, um, you know, the foam that we're looking at there, it's, it's XPS, but it's the newer formulation, the, the NGX, I think it's called where it has a much lower, it's more similar to like an EPS foam, um, roughly. 
Um, so pay attention to the materials that you are using, right? So we got rid of that concrete slab, the concrete we had to use, we knocked the embodied carbon back by 50% on top of that, all right? Um, steel, lots of embodied carbon, use fiberglass rebar, right? It's also less conductive. That's a great thing to do. Also design, um, try to engineer, work with your structural engineers so that you have less interior footings and point loads. Maybe there's a way to use a beam, in, you know, above instead of a grade beam. Um, maybe you can switch to a TGI or a parallel cord truss to avoid interior footings. So all those interior footings are going to require more foam and more concrete. So let's just not use them in the first place through good design, right? And uh, the other thing to point out is, um, you know, with the wood that you're using, if you can use the, you know, the Forest Stewardship Council certified wood uh, that comes from local sources, that's what we're doing on our current build, that's hugely impactful too. And um, I took this picture on the right because I was just remarking on how nice this framing lumber was. It was actually created as a number one, this one in front here. Um, that's some really great looking lumber that was harvested just locally here in uh, the Portland, Oregon area. So, and uh, with that, thanks. Thanks for letting me share this with you. Um, in the chat, I put a link to this um, uh, video that I did for Fine Home Building here that kind of go through step by step so you can actually um, see us install this. Um, but yeah, I look forward to any questions and hopefully there's some lively discussion here and you can try to stump the chump. Um, but thank you. Thanks, Josh. Cheers. Great job. Great job. Wonderful uh, work, and I always value the the uh, opinions of a design builder. You can tell that you're figuring it out and you're doing it, and the tips that you give are real world of like the true pains of making kind of like tweaks on the field. So it's great, uh, Shannon. We got a bunch of questions, right? Are you got any comments? Oh, none at all. No, nope. sorry, Josh. Nope. Nobody wants <laughs> to know anything. <laughs> yeah, this is not a very uh, you know controversial topic, is it? Not at all. You know, I think everyone's doing this now. Yeah, uh, right. Just too sarcastic to be true on that. We have had so much activity in the chat. We have a lot of questions and we have some time to take a number of them before we jump into the after hour. And we hope you can stay as long as possible to answer them all. First person is James Hartford. Hi, James. Hey, how's it going? Uh, <clears throat> I don't remember what my question was. Yes, um, can we use it um, in, uh, in like basement situations where we've got lateral loads from uh, soil pressure? Yeah, great question. Um, so I didn't come up with this idea, right? This is something that has been out in the wild for a little while. Um, this was originally designed, um, well, here's the, here's the backstory. So uh, this all goes back to Joe Stebrook, believe it or not. Um, Joe was working with um, Steve Basek, uh, the architect. And um, Steve had bought a house on the East Coast and was replacing the floor and was trying to figure out how to replace the slab in this thing. And him and Joe were standing there, so the story goes. And Joe says, well, why can't we just use wood, you know, instead of pouring the concrete here? And so that's kind of where this idea started. They didn't do quite this, but something similar. And then fast forward a few years, um, Steve Basek and a guy named Steve Demetric um, were sitting in the basement again. So the story goes, I wasn't there and saying, well, what's this slab doing here? Couldn't we just use wood? I think they had some other reasons to do that too. And so they ended up using um, essentially this exact same uh, assembly in that basement. And um, it worked well. Uh, in fact, they even had a, a pretty big flood. It's interesting. There was a, a building science and beer episode where Steve Demetric talks about this. And the thing got flooded and they went in, you know, got the dehumidifiers in there, mopped everything up, replaced all the first two feet of drywall. And the, um, they didn't have to really replace any of that plywood. It really was able to withstand that. Um, so the, the difference here is I kind of took that and was like, well, if they can do it in a basement, why can't we do it on slab and grade? And I think that that's what I contributed to this whole story. Um, so to answer your question in a long way, roundabout way is, um, yeah, in fact, it, it, it started out with the basement. And 
Um, I know that they had to have paid attention to those lateral loads and all the stuff that comes along with that, re retaining all that soil. They probably had bigger footings. I don't actually know. Right. Yeah. And having the, the footings keyed into the soil so that the footings themselves are doing that work. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, so I can't answer that specifically, but that'd be my hunch. Yeah. Good. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, James. And I think I just put the wrong link in the chat, but I did read that article with Stephen Basic and his daughter drew the detail for that article and I thought it was excellent. Mm -hmm. um, hey, Sean, how's it going? You want to jump in and say hi to Josh? I know you guys are friends. Yes. No, sorry that I'm late, everybody. Great stuff. I was able to catch it as I was, as I was driving home here. Um, Josh, I just want to say again, you know what, maybe I'll, I'll keep going with the questions and when we do the overtime, I'll say it a few great comments of who you are and what you've done so let's just keep going with the, the questions there Shannon because I know there's a lot and it's pretty full tonight with questions so keep it going absolutely the next question is from Hans Hans can you pick one of your questions yeah so they actually they both tie together pretty much the same thing thanks a lot this is really interesting um my worry is uh would the the subfloor not um independently potentially move from the rest of the building. And then the other question was about the compaction, whether or not it should be properly compacted in uh, with a tamper and multiple lifts. Yeah, um, hard to say. I mean, you know, the, the project that the Steves did, I think is maybe 15 years old now, and they haven't really noticed any, any movement. Um, you know, once you get your finishes installed and, and everything in there, it's hard to imagine that really shifting much, although I suppose it's possible. Um, so my hunch is you're not getting a lot of shifting from side to side or movement with the floating plywood slab. Um, and in terms of like, you know, compacting the gravel, you know, we did compact the three quarter inch gravel before we threw down that um, quarter minus. And uh, you know, we, we had lots of discussions about this. Um, do we need to compact that quarter minus and do it in lift so that it's really strong before you put down the, um, the foam? But then we couldn't square, well, how do you do that and make it perfectly level at the same time, right? I mean, if you're doing the kangaroo jumper or your plate compactor or something like that, how do you do that and then make it level? Um, so we, we've done it a couple different ways where we did go through and do the plate compactor and then threw down kind of like a, a thinner layer of quarter minus and screwed it out. And then we just did another one where we just threw down the quarter minus. Um, we have not noticed any settling or any issues. Granted, the first one we did is only about three years in the wild. Um, so we don't know, right? I mean, this is a, uh, a, a new and different thing. Uh, it might not be for everybody, right? Um, uh, we're willing to kind of stick our necks out there and try some stuff and you know if we fail that's not okay but it's you know we understand that risk um so yeah you know our team spent a lot of time discussing this and in the end we felt confident that screening out that quarter minus once you stand on this thing you put it together and you really nestle that uh foam in there it just doesn't move you know i mean it really spreads those loads out we're just we weren't concerned are you gluing your layers of the foam together with, uh, say, one part foam or so, or they're they're kind of like independently moving if they do move, but they probably don't move. Yeah, the foam is independent. We're not we're not gluing it together. Um, again, if someone wants to give it a shot and they find that that works better or something like that, I'm all ears. But uh, in this case, no. And then one of my questions was, do you do you, do you maybe see like a hybrid approach maybe down the line with? Uh, gravel being produced like instead of you know maybe eliminating some of the some of the compacted uh, gravel and using gravel for a top layer or so just a brainstorm really yeah no we've we've talked about that too and i think that could be really interesting um yeah why not right i mean if you could combine anytime you could combine two control layers into one if you could do the thermal and the capillary uh control layer as one you're just saved all that extra labor and materials and stuff so yeah i mean That'd be really interesting to try. I've also thought that some, like in my in my 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 own opinion, is that if you could add another vapor barrier 
between the gravel and like the sand, you know, the sand layer you have shown there and then let it dry to the inside. That might be interesting. You know, you're, you're flipping the vapor barrier. It's not really on the true warm side, but it's not really on a cold, cold side, you know, like, and then you're protecting the bottom layer. I don't know, just something I'm, I'm thinking out loud with. Yeah. Uh, the, this, um, the, the picture I've got up here is a little deceiving because that second layer of gravel is a different color. It looks like sand, but that's actually the quarter minus there. Um, you know, typically you're going to want to put your vapor barrier on top of your insulation layer. And, you know, at Building Science Corporation, um, Joe Stevert did some really interesting work on, on where to locate that. And, you know, long story short, the verdict is typically on top of your foam. And it's not just because of the condensation thing. Um, not worried about dew point there, just not. Um, so there's, there's other reasons it has to do with the concrete itself, which is interesting because it was meant to be that, that article I'm referring to was with concrete. So maybe it's different with wood. Be interesting to explore. Yeah, we did one project that we used perlite as the as a, as the subgrade insulation. And when we looked at the details from the 70s, they had a layer of six mil poly and then the perlite compacted down and then another layer on top of it. So we had like two vapor barriers and it was it was interesting to look at, but um, uh, something similar but different. Yeah, there's a builder in town, Scott Kosmecki, that's done the perlite thing, and he just left it in the bag. You know, it came in bags, and he just threw the bags down and then put the vapor barrier over the top. Um, so interesting. Yeah, it's, a, it's, all, it's all good stuff. And I love the Perminator, the, the uh, WR Meadows product, right? The right. green. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Good eye. <laughs> Get some wonks here. <laughs> it's a great name, Perminator, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so just leave it in the bag. Yeah, that's what that's what he did. It worked great. So. I love it. Mm. Well, our next question up is from James Reeb or Reib. I hope I am pronouncing your name correctly in one of those tries, James. Uh, yeah, your first try was right. And that might be the first person who's ever pronounced it correctly on the first try. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I was wondering with the... Uh, so when you're talking about uh, not putting down the, the floor layer until after you had the framing in to get it covered... Uh, like, would you be able to put it in earlier if you, like, if you use a different product instead of uh, the CDX ply, if you use like X factor or something along those lines? Uh, sure. But I mean, the, if you look at this, you know, uh, what's happening here on this diagram, you can see that vapor barrier has to get installed, right? Before you put down the plywood and that kind of dips down a little bit. So I guess what I'd be worried about is just creating a pond, right? So certainly you could use something that's a little more water resistant, but you'd still have that pond if it rained, right? I mean, I suppose if you're working in Phoenix, you know, well, who cares? There's no rain, but we're, we're here in Portland, Oregon. Um, but yeah, that, that's what I would worry about. Um, you know, you'd end up having probably to suck all that out. You're adding all that moisture into your assemblies and stuff, but, uh, you know, do what works for you. You know, if you, if you feel really great about your local weatherman, <laughs> um, and it's not going to rain, go for it. Awesome. Thanks for that question, James. Our next question up is from Michael McCauley. Michael asked, how are the framers managing the wall build on gravel versus a finished slab? Any grumbling? Tips we can share with our local builders? Yeah. Luckily, we work with a design build company, so we actually bring the build team in very early on in schematic design. And we talked about this. So the good thing about our team is like they saw it coming and they were a part of that conversation. And if you know it's coming, then it's okay when it happens, right? But I could imagine that if you just threw this detail out to a typical framing crew, you would get plenty of grumbling, right? Um, there was some photos in here where I showed um, exactly that right here on the right. So. Yeah, we built these um, sawhorses. I should say the team built the sawhorses. And on the right, they've actually stacked up a bunch of two by sixes on that stem wall. And the reason they did that is because they, um, you know, we've got our sill seal down, we've got our hold downs, and they wanted to be able to stand up that wall on that stack of two by. And then they slowly just remove pieces of two by to set it down onto um, those hold downs and, and sill bolts and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, they grumbled a little bit. They knew it was coming, so they were down, right? But that's part of the luxury of being a design build team. Um, 
this would be something you would very much want to talk to your contractor about, or if you're a contractor and you're subbing out the framing, you'd be want you'd want to have this conversation before they, um, you know, when you sent out your RFP, you'd want to put that in that proposal, right? Um, and, and talk about that. So they're able to price it right, know what's coming um, and work with you on that. Hopefully get some buy-in, right? You wouldn't want to throw this on just an unknowing team. It's, yeah, do you, guys uh, you know, I actually, oh, go ahead, Kevin. Sorry. <laughs> do you guys use a lull to lift the wall, or are you doing it manually? Yeah, we had wall jacks in this case. Um, All right. Yeah, but you could. Yeah, I mean, we in this case, the the site was really muddy, so our we didn't want to get the grade all stuck and so on and so forth. I love the I love the what we what I learned it as is the floppy bit, you know, the sequenced vapor barrier, air barrier thrown in there with sill seal and treating all those posts. It's, it's it's a great detail. And I think Hans mentioned in the chat that this kind of floor assembly and everything works for panelized construction too. Do you have any thoughts of doing panelized in the future or yeah? Um we're starting a um a FIAS um single family. 2,600 square foot home. Actually, it started. We, we're breaking ground in next week or so, um, where we are using panelized construction. Um, and we've also this uh, this project behind me um, right here. This is Going Street Commons. It's 11 zero energy homes. That uh, this is all panelized also. Um, so yes, uh, familiar with the panelized thing. And I'll, I'll put in a plug here for the Passive House Northwest one day conference based on panelization on May 20th in Olympia for those who are anywhere near our neck of the woods. Um, but yeah, right. If you could pair this, there's no reason you couldn't pair this um, foundation assembly with panelized. I think that could be great. Who's making your panels? Collective Carpentry. Nice. Sweet. Yeah. Those yeah. guys rock. They've been great. Yes. They, they, uh, they showed us their cellulose setup. It was pretty sweet how they have a container and a, their machine and they're, they're good dudes. They're, they're true tinkerers and innovators. I, uh, I, I enjoy seeing their presentation and hoping all the success and hearing that they're building 11 for you. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty awesome to hear. This was a different company here. This was, um, so their the current project is with oh, Collective. Okay. This one here was uh, Phoenix House was the- Oh, nice. yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, next up then is Barbara and Oz. Welcome, Barbara. Are you having hey, coffee? You yeah, long time no see, how are you? Um, I think Josh may have actually answered my question as well. I had two. One, can this be done with a prefab house? And I assume panelized is effectively prefab. And two, can you get rid of a lot of the petrochemical foam that you used as the insulation? Yeah, we well, don't have a label yet here in Australia. I, sure. Yeah. I mean, um, I know there's a lot of work that's being done with folks that are using rock wool um, sub slab. Um, I suppose I would ask my structural engineer if that would be sufficient to support your typical loads. And if you could swap out that um, that foam, the petrochemical plastics in lieu of something like that. Yeah. I mean, that would be great. Right. I mean, anywhere we can get some gains on saving embodied carbon and that'd be yeah. worth go for it. Let me know how it goes. Okay, good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Just to elaborate on that. So we standardly get uh, rock wool in the 80 pound. It's rock wool 80. And mm -hmm. that's 80 pounds per square foot, right? And then there's another one that's a 110. I know standard XPS is 25 PSI. And then they have 100 PSI. So both the rock wools should be able to handle the load of an internal wall. Uh, just off the top of my head. And I'm pretty sure, I don't know the structural capacity of the, of the Neopore, the Geo, Geo EPS, the uh, EPS with the graphite, uh, but I'm pretty sure they're, they're well within those ranges. But you, like everything, you gotta check your data sheets and, and uh, run it past the engineers, but just wanted to share some technical nerdness. No, I agree on all those Thanks. points, yeah. Well, thanks, Kevin. Our next question is from Brian Keach in my home state, but his city of Pittsburgh. Yeah, thank you. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, I had two questions. The first one's already been answered about internal loads, but uh, the second one was about um, codes and local code officials. Do you get any or a lot of resistance in your projects in the past with uh, 
doing a floor that's not concrete, but it is on grade? Yeah, good question. Um, so there's nothing in the code that says you can't do this. And, and we've been very clear with our um, you know, plans examiners and, and codes officials about that. Um, here in Portland, um, our local building department is pretty uh, flexible and open to, to stuff like this. Um, they also know us pretty well down there too, because we're always throwing weird stuff at them. So they're like, oh, <laughs> here comes another bird's mouth project. But um, we recently did do this in a uh, neighboring county and there we we came to them very early on before we even submitted our plan set to the county and said hey we've done this before um, here's some information about it here's the relevant code pieces and here's what we propose will you be okay with this and we definitely got some you know questions and you know luckily we got some curiosity too and had a little bit of back and forth and they agreed to it. And so then we proceeded with this particular assembly. If they had um, really grumbled or otherwise, we would have just went to a different type of assembly altogether. So we were super proactive on that. Uh, I can definitely see certain you know, jurisdictions just not understanding nor caring to get to understand it either. Um, Suffice it to say, we, we did our code research and there's just nothing in there that, um, it's mostly written for concrete, you know? Um, so that those particular code sections and um, we've been, haven't had a problem yet, but I could see how that could be an issue. Okay, that's very helpful, thank you. Josh, as, as, uh, as you're talking through that, I'm thinking, do you know estimated, like how much, are you saving money by doing, concrete less uh less slabs or do you think it's kind of like a wash you know bringing doing it with your own labor as opposed to hiring a sub subcontractor yeah um so we've done uh you know different scenarios with a typical slab on grade with a wood floor um and then the plywood with a wood floor um and really um it used to be that the the plywood well it depends right now plywood's so expensive right so it used to be that we could come in, you know, cheaper with the plywood slab on grade because you're skipping some steps and we have those better margins. Like I mentioned, we could do this in house. Right. Um, but, you know, when you start getting into $75 a sheet, um, it, it, that has a big impact. And so we found currently that it's about a wash. I think the difference for a 2,500 square foot home was something in the like less than a thousand dollars difference. Um, between the two, um, should plywood pricing go back down, then I would expect the, the plywood slab on grade to be cheaper, but um, I wish I could read the future. Awesome. Well, next time you'll have to just come back with the crystal ball, Josh. I know, yeah, sorry, I, I forgot it. Yeah. It's okay, you brought the magic wand this time, so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Moving on to Tim Moss. Hello. Hi, Tim. Thanks for the presentation. That was great. Um, I'm curious. My original question was kind of sparked by the idea of what you do. Well, how does this, can this work? Actually, it's, I'm sorry, let me back up. <laughs> Basically, I'm wondering in New York City area where we work, um, we're often working near the uh, water table when we're doing foundation work. And I'm wondering, you know, we have hydrostatic pressure, we have perched water, we have runoff, we have water main breaks, we have hurricanes, all these things that, that and if you're down at those levels where you're potentially <clears throat> near that point, is, is this um, really feasible in any way? And, and I guess it leads to the question, like, are, are there kind of specific scenarios where this is not a great idea to, to, to go this route? Yeah, I mean, with construction and design, it's all about your risk tolerance or risk management, right? So, um, you know, if you're in low laying areas or you get floods, you're flood prone or any of the stuff that you just mentioned, you'd really want to think about this, right? I mean, could this withstand multiple floods and in, in constant water contact or would concrete be better? I mean, the storage capacity of concrete, you know, it's just, it's not going to degrade, right? So in those particular circumstances, you'd want to think long and hard about that. Um, you know, again, a lot of this goes back to just basic good building hygiene, where you're in design hygiene, where you're making sure you got your footing 
um, you know, drain, rain your drains and stuff like that below your footing, reducing that hydrostatic pressure. We also stuck some drains in the gravel uh, area and daylighted those through the stem wall because uh, we, in this last house we did, it was on a slope. So we were able to do that. So belt and suspenders, you know, um, then it was making sure that we're grading, um, you know, the site away from the building, hooking up our gutters, setting the gutters to daylight, um, all that stuff. Um, you know, when you consider all that, the only way water is really going to get in there is if somehow the water got higher than the slab. And if that's the case, then you're, you have a big problem anyways, right? So, um, you know, other areas are like termite and, and things like that. If you're in a really high termite zone or really prone flood, this might not be the best solution, right? I, I don't claim to say that this is the, you know, the golden arrow for all foundations, right? But I think in, in certain cases, I think it's really compelling. And Josh, it's also interesting too, again, the fact that you're in the Pacific Northwest dealing with seismic areas and that you're able to do this just kind of shows you that, again, the, the foundation takes the, the loads and the structure and the slab is just- What's it doing? Cosmetic, right, so. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Tim. And we are gonna move on to Ben Walk from Seattle, Washington. Hey, Josh. Hey, Ben. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, well, um, I think my question already got answered. Um, it was mostly about using this in a walkout basement situation. I have a project up here that clients uh, interested in potentially a concrete free slab, but um, it's in a kind of an old barn. It's a walkout basement with um, you know, it's got some water in it, so it's just wondering the suitability of that and, you know, the resistance of it in that kind of situation. Yeah. Again, it's been done in basements. That's kind of where the idea came from. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's all about just good design and build hygiene, right? I mean, your footing drains, making sure you're reducing the hydrostatic pressure, sloping the building, the slope from the building away, gutters, downspouts. Uh, it really could work fine if it's done right in that scenario. Hey Josh. Mm -hmm. Great talk. Yeah, good to see you. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Next Shannon, question up. Can we ask Bob in, Kelly? Kevin? Bob Kelly's question about screws. Is Bob uh, Bob in the house? Bob's in the house. What's hey, up, Kevin? Bob? <laughs> ask okay. your question, buddy. Okay, well, I am, um, of course, every time I think about screwing, you know, two layers of three-quarter plywood together, I think about spin out, right? So how coarse is your screw? What size, what size gauge is your screw? What's the driver head? Star drive, T25, square drive, Phillips, whatever. Let's get, let's get down and dirty with screws. Yeah. Wow. You're going to, you're going to stump me a little bit here. So um, I don't recall the exact fastener that we used. Um, I do know that it was um, a star drive um, exterior rated. I think it had a pretty coarse, you know, thread to it. Um, specifically, I don't remember. I know that it was an inch and a quarter. Um, I know that on the first project, we, um, you know, bent down and screwed it in. Since then, we've got the, you know, the stand up, you know, collated screws that you can kind of just install while standing up. It goes a lot quicker. Um, but good questions, you know, I mean, yeah, you'd want to pay attention. I'd say grab a couple scraps and see what works. And, um, and unfortunately, I don't recall exactly the, the fastener we use. Okay, because that's, you know, like a, a number eight is a complete failure. Number 10, yeah, you might get 80% of the screws to grab, but, you know, number 12 coarse thread would be awesome. Yeah, so good you question. Know, something... you, need, you, need, you need Robertson bits versus your Phillips bits, and you might get actually something to work out. Yeah, totally. And the honest yeah. answer is the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Oh, my pleasure. Oh, you know, one last question, if you don't mind, is that I was wondering about the foundation, you know, because I, I think it might be a fallacy, but I've always thought that a slab helps to lock in the footing on a foundation. So is that an issue here? Or um, do you think we are stable with the, or do you do a wider footing maybe to Give more it'll, or what? it'll depend on your specific circumstance, but if you're building on a flat site, 
Um, it really doesn't have any lateral component to it. Uh, like a basement that's retaining a lot of earth may, and there was a previous question about, about that. You might want a bigger footing. And certainly when you get into bigger buildings and you have post-tension slabs and, and things like that, or if you have using your slab as your structural bearing capacity, uh, you know, if, if you're doing a mechanic shop or something like that, maybe the plywood isn't the best idea. Um, but no, typically it, it doesn't have that component to it. It's not really structural. It's just something to stand on. That's really cool. By the way, my girlfriend, Linda here, she's an architect and this is her first Passive House show and she won't miss another one. Awesome. Thanks, Bob. Great All stuff. Right. Thanks for everything. Bob did his homework, he brought a friend. It said he did. <laughs> Kudos to Bob. And again, Bob, this is an interesting discussion, right? Because we've talked about, you know, doing raft slabs versus this type of detail. Yeah. I mean, we, we thought the raft slab was great because you had that insulation that just kind of wrapped around the base. And now with what Josh is proposing again, as we go back to the footing detail and we put the insulation around that, but we've got rid of the concrete. And again, the work that he, they've done here to look at the embodied carbon. Um, and so, I mean, it's it's really great stuff here, just looking at all the passive house details, but also looking at the embodied carbon and material. So, you know, it's almost like air sealing under grade and, and the thinness of the membrane is still effective as the thickness of the insulation that we think is good, but it, it seems like the equation is how can how far can we back off from what we think is right? That's that's how I view vapor control. So it's it's interesting. So thanks for your time. I really appreciate being here. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. And thanks for bringing a friend. Everyone else, you just he's leading by example. So follow his lead. And our next question is from Sandra Lester. Hi, Sandra. Hey there, um, certified passive house designer in Toronto, Canada. And my question is about control of moisture. So um, I did miss the beginning, you might've covered it, but what I'm wondering is if we have a system that's kind of sitting into a ground, is it getting moist? And then if we're further kind of, um, sealing that in with a vapor barrier and a plywood um, that's the exterior plywood, I guess, would be non-air permeable. Like, are we kind of trapping moisture and making the wood rot and what would prevent that? Yeah, yeah I touched on that a little bit, but I'm happy to, because it's a common question, right? So um, Gosh, feel free to bring your detail back up if you want. Yeah, please. That's a bridge too yeah, far. Sure. Let me share here. And Sandra, while he's doing that, um, Josh offered to share his slides. So if, yeah, so uh, what my experience is that I had a wooden garage and it had a dirt floor. So what we did was we put wood pallets on the floor and then we put an air va vapor barrier and then we put plywood over that um, and the whole thing rotted <laughs> and just became a big pot of mold. So yeah. that's, so, I'm trying to think like, what's so different about this and why does it work so well? Yeah. So, you know, what you want to avoid is you want to pay attention to a couple of things, the storage capacity of the material, right? So concrete has a really high storage capacity of materials where you could put it underwater. It doesn't care. Something like an OSB has a very low storage capacity of materials. You put it underwater, it's going to rot pretty quickly, right? Or like a wood fiber board. Plywood is a little more durable than OSB. So we use plywood for a reason here, right? Um, and then you want to make sure that you're allowing this material to have more capacity to dry than it does potential to get wet, right? So in, you know, in, into, you know, I think, was it, um, Kevin was throwing this out there, was you could also use like an Advantech or something like that, that's got, um, you know, the ability to kind of take on more uh, water without getting harmed. So, um, we have one vapor control layer here. So the ground is gonna be 100% relative humidity. Your uh, living space is gonna be less than that, right? And so your vapor drive is gonna to wanna to go into the building from the ground, from high to low. And this green membrane that I'm showing right here is our, you know, it's, it's a class one vapor barrier. So the water molecules in their gaseous state simply can't get through there. And the plywood's on top of that. And if the plywood was to get wet from a source from up above, it has the ability to dry to the inside, especially if you're pairing this with 
you know, a, a ventilation system, um, you know, a dehumidification system or something like that, that most high quality and certainly passive house buildings have. So um, we're, if you were to create a, a sandwich, and I, I touched on this a little bit, if you were to, you know, put an impermeable flooring over the entire thing, and then your dishwasher overflowed or your kid left the tap on and you had two impermeable vapor barriers with the wood in the middle, then you would be very worried, right? Because then it wouldn't have that ability to dry and you could get that rot, right? So um, you want to be careful with the flooring you choose. You want to make sure that you have good drying capacity to the interior and you want to make sure that you're stopping bulk water and then breaking the vapor. As long as you have that one vapor barrier and it's continuous, there, there really shouldn't be much of, of an issue with it. Yeah, does that Thanks help? for going through that. Yeah, thank you so much, Josh. Hmm. Yeah, I'm still a little bit confused about why the wood in the gravel doesn't rot. Yeah, the wood's not in the gravel, right? So okay. the, there's, as you can see here, there's the, the two layers of gravel. Um, mm -hmm. One's a capillary break, so it's going to stop bulk water from getting in. We've also got our footing drain, which is going to stop bulk water from getting in there. So belt and suspenders. Then mm -hmm. we've got our thermal layer, right, with the foam. Then we've got this green vapor barrier on top of that, and then the plywood. So there's no way. Oh, so do we water. don't too many have have any wood joists running through the floor at all? No. Okay. It's floating. Yeah. Okay, I was confused by your framing. Yep, it's just a floating raft of, of plywood. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, Andrew, I think in your floor you did, I believe you had the pallets below the vapor barrier and then the yeah. plywood above where the where the the vapor barrier should have been below the pallet. And that would have hopefully let it breathe. Would, yeah. Because what we dry. found was the, remember, the vapor barrier. Yeah, the vapor barrier, like we had rain coming through the roof, and then the vapor barrier the water got underneath the plywood and then the vapor barrier sagged between the the supports of the of, of the the um pallets and it created these like little pools of water oh i'm so sorry yeah and again <laughs> the big so thing bad. in the building right is so you got to keep bulk water out of our buildings and once we let it in then chaos happens oh definitely so again, but that's we really you... appreciate you sharing yeah. what went wrong, right? Because some people will take away a, a lot of what Josh has talked about tonight and go at it intuitively. And for those of us who did that before we got Passive House certified, we made some fun mistakes too. And maybe not in this way, but in other ways. So yep. yeah, build it tight, get it right, copy the best details you can find. And if you can do a high growth thermal model, even better. Peter, you still have your yeah. hand up, but you were nodding your head along with me. Did you want to chime in on this or uh, should I add you to the queue? Yes, I'd like to comment on this topic uh, that you put pallets, which have a four inch air gap. And as was stated that the vapor barrier was above them and not below them. So you've got all that moisture with air to oxidize and okay any moisture it got plenty of room to rot out the floor uh if you said you had wet no place to go um yeah it's it's just the way that was constructed or layered and that's where you run into trouble so it's just your assembly yeah. your sequencing and assembly makes a great deal of difference go ahead yeah wherever you put your air vapor barriers determine your hydro hydrological performance, right? So so like all of that becomes the most careful part of the of the portion of the of the work. Like it, yeah, I would I would I would like to see like a um a reclaimed pallet floor floating floor kind of idea, but you, you with, could certainly with do all that. of this built into it. Yeah, you could take this example that's up on the screen here. Um is it still sharing? I think so. Yeah, it yeah. is. Uh, yeah. Um and instead of plywood, you could do, you know, whatever you want, right? I mean, you can put your pallets mm -hmm. on there too. And, and what I'll say is like, you always want to pay attention to your four control layers. And it's really good to draw those out. And even if you can use different colors for every of those every one of those control layers. So first and foremost, your bulk water, then your air tightness, then your vapor, and last your thermal control layer. And draw those out and make sure that your um, 
keeping them all continuous and that you're not going to end up with trapping moisture or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I would say, make sure that your uh, structural layer is structurally able to handle the, the loads. So I'm not sure about the pallets on that one, but I sure. love the idea to, of reclaiming stuff and reusing stuff, especially with the expense of plywood. But I'm not sure if you were here for another good takeaway Josh mentioned, which is really dig into the specs of every material you're using in your layers. Because if one of them has a surprise layer that is perm closed, so the vapor can't get through, you'll create a vapor sandwich even when you think you're, you've got it right. Um, so he talked about his click lock flooring. I love click lock flooring, but I didn't know that some of them put a layer of plastic in even in the, the good stuff, right? I knew to stay away from the bad stuff, the vinyls and some of the, the less than um, non-toxic <laughs> models. But uh, thanks, Sandra. I, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thanks. I know what went wrong. <laughs> okay, yeah, great, thank you. It's great there, Josh. You really brought the BS tonight, the building <laughs> science. So great stuff. Uh, um, I agree with BS. Everyone, I apologize. I have to now switch my accelerator hat to my softball coach and dad hat. Um, but I wanted before I go to make sure you all heard what Josh said earlier about May 20th. So if you're in the Pacific Northwest or if you want to come up to Olympia, um, there is going to be some great discussion. And for those that love prefab like myself and some other like minded individuals here, it's going to be a great day and lots of great discussion and a lot of fun. And of course that is with a pH. So hopefully you will uh, sign up and maybe we can find the link for, uh, for that uh, event. Shoot, I should have been prepared and put it in what there. What is that, Sean? Name the event and I'll get it for you. Uh, I think even Josh could probably find it quickly because I know that I, I, it was in my email from Scott from uh, yesterday. So hopefully that is on your calendar. Yeah, pnw.org. You'll find it there. And I'll mention I'm butting in because Sean is the MC for this event. So uh, you didn't mention that, but uh, well, we'll be it's, there. It's, I'm more of like MT, master of timing, than I am the M MC. I think you guys will be the uh, the real uh, champions of that day, which again, it's nice to uh, get together and meet all of our friends because it's been a few years since we've had uh, that event. So I'm really looking forward to it. And, and again, I got to meet a lot of uh, great Passive House colleagues from uh, Passive House Northwest event. So I'm looking forward to it. So uh, everybody like what Bob did, your homework is you got to bring a friend next week and uh, enjoy a glass of wine and or another beverage of some sort and enjoy. So see your one next week. Lots of good stuff. Talk Thanks, to you Sean. Go team. <laughs> I want to play softball. All right. Yeah, well, coach. Yeah, put me in coach. Great. Our next question up is, well, we had Richard Arnett who left and he had three, but I went over his and I think they all got answered. So Ian Broomfield, are you still with us, Ian? I Would you am. like to unmute? No, I'm here, but, but Josh already answered my question, but it's really interesting stuff and it certainly got my wheels spinning. So thanks, Josh. Cheers. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Ian. How about Scott Stewart? No, nope, no, Scott Stewart. Let's move on to Stephen Glickman. I know Stephen's here. Hi, Stephen. Hey there. Uh, my question was, and I've, I've done this uh, once before, putting two layers of, putting a floor, in my case, on concrete, because it was like 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and I think the specs for that from, I assume, the wood council or whoever was uh, the running game at that point was to have two diagonally layered pieces of plywood slightly gapped and not fastened obviously to the concrete floor and then putting our hardwood over it. And I was wondering, is your second layer, you said your first layer was tongue and groove and then you just glued it uh, to the second layer. Is your second layer tongue and grooved as well and are they screwed together? Yeah, so um, they, they are both tongue and groove, the first layer and the second layer. So there is no gapping and they are glued and screwed together. Essentially what we're trying to do is create just a thicker piece of plywood for that stability, right? right. I suppose you Mini can get- Mini CLT, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, exactly. Um, so the idea being is that it could expand and contract at the same rate. I, my, you know, when you're gapping those things, that's really meant to allow for that movement. But what we're trying for here is to create like a, a monolithic ply 
so it is glued and screwed together um, and we yeah. got the tongue and groove yeah well we had some moisture issues obviously coming through the uh like had a giant bubble in the room we had to put a really heavy stone cable in the middle till it dried out but that was amusing uh probably undid a lot of the nailing but uh be that as it may thank you great presentation cheers thanks i see uh sorry i'm muted there um we have Stephen to thank for the the uh concrete free slab i did because he got his issue of fine home building before i did so he sent it to me and then i got it in the mail and the rest is history so thank you Stephen. All right, next up is Bruce Zahn in Milwaukee. Hey all, uh, I'm an architect and CPHC in Milwaukee. Uh, question was in regard to use of radiant flooring in this uh, type of installation. Have you had any experience? And second, would that possibly replace one of the plywood layers or would you simply go above the two layer that you have. I yeah, was thinking. Um, I was thinking specifically of using warm board as opposed to a lightweight concrete or something like that. Yeah, um, I would pay attention to the permeability of that product that you're putting down there. So you know, the warm board, I would definitely dig into that. I, I forget if that's an OSB product or if that's one of the um, um, the composite products, but clearly you'd want it to be vapor open. Um, and I would probably install that over the second layer of plywood so that you can have that, like I said, that monolithic rigidity. So you're not getting a uh, flex in there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're here with a bunch of passive house builders, right? I mean, typically uh, a, a radiant floor is gonna be such overkill, uh, just way too much horsepower for a house like this, right? So what we have done is done some just electric resistance heat in specific areas like bathrooms or maybe in a, a common hallway or something like that. And oh, there's certainly so no issue with, with that, um, right? Under tile, again, that decoupling membrane, they sell products that you can actually weave in your electric resistance cable with. I think um, Schluter uh, makes one. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could do that, but again, you'd want to make sure that is an impermeable product. So you'd want to use it just in certain spots to allow for that drying to adjacent areas. Um, so, yeah, th the point being is, yeah, it's a good point about the overkill. But... Yeah, um, you certainly could. There's there's nothing wrong with it as long as you're paying attention to your structure yeah. and you got enough you know structure and your um, your permeability of those materials. So you're not trapping moisture. Gotcha. Thank you. Good presentation. Look forward to the slides. Cheers. Thanks, Bruce. And Darrow, you changed your name. So I almost missed you and asked your question for you because I have the same question. And hopefully it didn't get covered while I was distracted with my work. Uh, would you like to come on and ask your question? Yes. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure if this was answered already. I joined late. But yeah, it was about if um glass gravel or the gravel product could be used to replace both the foam insulation and gravel yeah this did come up and the answer is yeah i think that's a great idea um gravel is not super available in our market currently um but i know on the east coast there's um it's it's more available yeah go for it like let me know how it goes like yeah i'd love to cool. see it mm -hmm. I, thank you because i i missed that answer the first time around too. Uh, next up is Jeff and Mary. Hello. Um, can you see me? Hey. Uh, so actually, I think I may have asked a couple questions in the thread. Um, one was about gluing the layers together, which I see you've done. Um, also just shout out, Jeff and Mary Holtquist are the owners of the house that Josh's team is building right now. I've got my clients on the call. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> so it's super exciting to see pictures of our build in this presentation. Um, and uh, super exciting to see what they've, you know, the level of care that's been taken uh, in all of these decisions and all of these options. It's uh, super interesting to see what the passive house community is up to. So I guess that's it. 
I mean, yeah. no question. Yeah. That's oh, great. No, that's definitely not it, Jeff and Mary, because now that we know you're here and we really appreciate you attending, we'd love to hear um, how working with Josh changed how you think about your house. Well, I mean, it's 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 a build site so far. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Um, but yeah, we um, decided we it, we had re recently retired, and um, we, you know, this is our you know retirement home, and we wanted it to be you know accessible or universal design. And we wanted it you know to be passive, and you know just went to Birdsmouth and said you know what what do you got? And uh, you know all these you know very well thought out uh details it's just been so encouraging about uh you know that this is the way to build structures now because we you know mary and i are both familiar with sort of standard build technology you know you know we've owned houses our whole lives and you know with two by four and no insulation in the walls and uh so it's it's super interesting to see um what what a new house can be you know as opposed to a house that you know the house i'm in right now is probably 50 years old and there's no insulation really <laughs> and, um, well we'd love to invite you back when you get a chance to experience how much more comfortable you will be i'm looking and, forward to uh, it, how yeah. better the indoor air quality is going to be mm -hmm. and how much less you have to dust because i know you do the dusting <laughs> So. That's right. <laughs> yes, he does. Oh, there's, there's Hello, Aaron. Mary. <laughs> well, so uh, yeah. Um, the other thing that I, I wanted to uh, to mention is we are just so amazed at the quality and the thought that has gone into this. Um, as as Jeff said, we've we've been part of other builds for like Habitat and such, um, and just seeing from the, the other houses that, that we've lived in, everything, I mean, you actually have square corners and, and walls that, that are, are thought up, are, yeah. the care is yeah, just Bird's, incredible. Bird's mouth is a tiny bit obsessive. Um, just and we love them. <laughs> Just this afternoon, I saw them move a truss about a quarter of an inch. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. I don't know if you know that. That's a lot. No. <laughs> well, congratulations. Well, we appreciate it and thank you. Yeah. Congratulations. Jeff and Mary, welcome to the Passive House family. Welcome to Construction Tech, uh, you know, Passive House Live. And one thing I always like to say is every high performance house is high performance owners who care about quality. And uh, you deserve nothing but the best in your retirement. And we we look to, to to get in touch with you later on once you're living in your house. It'd be a great experience to share. Oh, we'd thank love you. to. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a great team. Those we that sure share did. the most, care the most, and are the most trusted on the construction site. And I can tell that uh, that that's who you're dealing. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's fabulous. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, I swear they're not my parents. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, yes, please invite them back, Josh. Please come back when it's done. We'd love to share the success. Um, and we are ready for the second time around on some folks who had more than one question. And Tim Moss has been very patient with his hand up. So, uh, Tim, would you like to come on and ask your question? Sure. I just had a question. I was wondering, since it's, you know, more or less okay to use some impermeable materials in certain select areas, is there a point at which, like, where's the cutoff? Is there like a, a percentage that's okay? And then it becomes sort of questionable. I, I don't know if you even would know something like that. Yeah, uh, great question. I, I, I w there's not a scientific answer that I know of with this, right? Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a gut. It's a, wow, that seems like that's too much. I don't feel comfortable. Um, you know, in the example I showed the, the bathroom, um, it was a relatively small bathroom. Uh, it was maybe you know, eight by 10 or less. So, and it was big expanses to either side of it. We didn't feel like it was an issue, but yeah, I mean, if it was like half the floor, I don't, I don't think so. It's so maybe less than half. <laughs> I don't know. 
good good Sounds question good. though yeah Josh, I don't know if you saw the chat, but there was quite a bit of chatter about the MGO board. I think Advantex rolling it out. I have a sample of it here, mm. um, uh, and it seems to be vapor permeable. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I think it's expensive. I'm not really sure exactly how much it costs, but um, uh, might be a cool non-rotting uh, product to to consider. My uh, my good friends in there are crushing it in the chat about the MGO board, but um, uh, it could be another alternative. I always like to put things in my assembly that I know aren't going to, don't have the ability to rot that are vapor permeable, but have you ever thought of uh, the MGO or maybe some gypsum product or Verrock or something like that? Yeah, I'm aware of it, right? Uh, along with some of the Advantech products and some of the newer ones that, you know, they're wood-based products too. Um, you know, ultimately it goes back to that storage capacity of materials. Clearly the MGO board, you know, that's going to be very resilient. And um, if you could use that, that, in its vapor open um and it structurally works um then then great right i mean it, it just becomes like typically like you know it's a balance between performance cost availability um you know trade knowledge all that stuff but from a strictly science perspective that would be a great product to use for this i don't i don't see any issue with it awesome thank you yeah yeah, there's a lot of really great subjects going on in the chat uh, from some very smart folks who are uh, sharing information. But I want to go back to a question if, uh, let me see if Ben is still here. Ben Wolk had about a uh, final layer of, of sand. Ben, do you want to come on and elaborate on that? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that earlier. <laughs> Thanks. That's for a cool question. Um, yeah, I think I had seen um, maybe artisans will talk about that before of doing uh, a layer of sand. You know, doing maybe a thin layer of the quarter minus and then a layer, a thicker layer of sand over it so you can trench the piping um, easier under the foam. I don't know if that's you know, something you guys looked at or you just wanted to do one layer of quarter, you know, well, you had to <laughs> pile up the quarter inch minus anyways, but um, yeah, yeah, that is a consideration. Yeah, um, I know that Artisans does that quite a bit. In fact, we're building one of their projects this summer and yeah, we're using a lot of sand in there. So, um, but the thing I would think about in this particular assembly with sand is just, you wouldn't want that to filter into your, um, you know, three quarter layer and yeah. clog up your capillary break and start wicking water up in there. Um, so, I, you know, maybe, uh, you know, if you put like a, um, a weed barrier in between or something like that, I, that's the mm -hmm. one thing that occurs to me that I would think about. So um, yeah, just making sure that you keep that capillary, you know, break. That's a that's a big bulk water control layer right there that you yep. want to go follow on. That is such a great point. There's also a lot of chatter in the chat about kind of having a rain screen air layer for ventilating under the assembly. Um, has anyone want to chime in on that? Or have you seen that, Josh, in any permutation? No, I haven't seen it. Uh, I don't think there'd be any harm done. I also, you know, it'd be another step. I, I don't know what it what it gains you, um, really. I, I'm not too concerned, like I said, about bulk water or vapor um, there. And if you did get bulk water above it, I'm not sure what that would do for you anyways. Um, so it would. I, I haven't seen it anyways. Yeah, I have, I've, I've seen the, the drawing that um, Alexandra Basic did was similar to the one that I did on the garage conversion because with the existing slab underneath there and the potential for water and rising damp, we trenched and put in drainage to the exterior, which allowed any moisture that was underneath our, our barrier to get out. So I don't know, um, have you thought about doing that here just in case? Uh, not that you need to, but. Yeah, you know, in our current project, um, Jeff and Ryan's project, we did run, um, you know, a trench with the French train in the gravel area and daylighted it through the stem wall to the outside. Yeah. We also have the, you know, the drain, uh, the footing drain around the outside too. Right. Um, so we're really trying to employ every you know, belt, suspender, whatever you've got to hold your pants up to see about the analogy. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, those are all great ideas, right? I mean, you, we should we should be doing that. And if you can fit that into your budget and if that lessens your risk, then by all means, it, that's a good idea. Great, thanks. Uh, next are Barbara and Sandra. If you guys are still around, Barbara, you're first. 
Oh, Barbara had to leave, but you know, that makes sense because she's in Australia. Uh, Sandra, are you still with us? Yeah, my second question had to do with the um, hydrological pathways through the assembly and that was already answered. Okay, well, I'll ask Barbara's other question then. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, Barbara mentioned that they're in a termite zone and their home was built on brick piers. Would this foundation work on piers or steel piles? Uh, well, I mean, as long as your engineer is okay with supporting the walls and the structure with that, you know, that's fine. I mean, that's an answer for you. That's a question for your engineer, not really for me. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, then I would just go back to those four control layers, right? Like, are you making sure that you're dealing with the bulk water, like the drain tile we just talked about and the capillary and that stuff? Are you paying attention to your, you know, you know, in this case, the air barrier, you're, on, you're underground, there's no air. Um, so that's good. Uh, then your vapor control layer, and then lastly, your thermal. And so as long as you're paying attention to those four layers, um, how you support the, the house around it, it, it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, um, and, and to the termite thing, you know, I, I talked about that too. I mean, there's a lot of good practice you can do to keep these bugs from being attracted to the thing in the first place and, and being able to inspect and check. Um, and if you keep that plywood dry, you know, termites are interested in, in moist wood, not dry wood. Um, and, you know, again, like if you live in a, a highly, you know, termite filled area, then maybe choose a different foundation assembly. You know, there's time and a place for concrete. Go, go with the less embodied carbon version of the concrete slab, maybe. Thank you so much. And uh, I just put a note in the chat that if I missed anybody's questions or I did not invite you to ask an additional question that you had, feel free to unmute now and chirp in so that you have a chance while we still have Josh. But if we don't hear from anyone shortly. Hello. hello. Oh, it's uh, Lance here from Edmonton. Lance? Yes. Lance Waite. I, I'm a structural engineer. And uh, we have a system up here that uh, a friend and a uh, guy I've worked with for a long time that uh, it uh, embodies some carbon, but it's, uh, it's EPS based. And uh, we've probably installed uh, probably, I don't know, 150 of them in this neck of the woods here. And they're uh, basically a, uh, I, I posted a, uh, a connection to the site, but it's basically we have uh, whatever wall foundation you have, uh, we put in a layer of, uh, of five inches of uh, rigid EPS that has entrained in it, a CNC cut into it, a uh, structural seal stud. And then when you uh, lay that down on uh, uh, a compacted layer of sand. And yes, it's a, the hardest part of the whole thing is to screed that sand and put the last little bit in there so that it, it's, a, it's a, a good and level floor. Then you just lay this material down and it has flutes in it so that uh, one place you interconnected. So you put a uh, radon extractor in it because we have to require that here. Then you lay down uh, a uh, poly. We prefer a 10 mil poly, but often a six mile will do it. It has to be taped exceedingly well. So Kevin will know how to do that. And uh, so does Sean. And then it runs up the wall so that it's, it's sealed. And uh, then you just uh, lay over uh, 5 H T and G and uh, screw it down. Now that provides uh, a, uh, a, diaf a floor diaphragm. So you don't have any difficulty with uh, as uh, Josh was talking about uh, the uh, potential of a basement having uh, having some horizontal load on the, on the foundation wall. And uh, it does all of the same things and, and does does that which uh, the plywood floor does, except it's, it's, it's rigid. And uh, it does the same thing like it's a, it's a warm, a comfy floor uh, with a 75 to 100, and I don't know, he'd have, Mark would have to tell you how many he's installed. Uh, in this part of the world and uh, we've had no complaints whatever and the people that like it the best are the people that lay it down themselves because it does not require anything but a little bit of patience. <laughs> so there's a connection in, the, in, in my question there if anybody wants to, to, to scope it out on uh, 
uh, it's called CIS Constructions. I don't know, I'd have to, I'd have to look at my post. Thank I, you, Lance. All right. We Thanks, appreciate everybody. We appreciate your input and your professional opinion as being a structural engineer who attends Passive House Construction Tech Live. You know, it's uh, it's great to hear. Well, and technical. Do, who, who do I uh, speak to or I speak to or the guy that owns the company? Uh, to uh, make a presentation such as Joss did. Uh, yeah, sponsorship. Uh, you can go go talk to Zach, or uh, and then you know we can if you have a, a presentation you want to do, you can hit one of us up. We'd be happy to to see. Uh, oh, he, 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 okay. Good. Uh, yeah. Hello at passivehouseaccelerator.com, and we'd love to invite yeah. anyone who has a project that they yeah. want to share with us to please email and share it with us. We all jump right online and chat with you about it and talk through what the uh, all the little steps are that Josh just went through uh, in order to come on and share his great work with us tonight. So please thank him for the presentation and connect with him yes, online. Yes, I've just I, thrown I, I some more you. links. In, hang on one sec, Lance. I've just <laughs> thrown some more links into the chat. And um, I just want to make sure, uh, let's see. They, someone wants to see your post again. James Hartford wants to see your post again, Lance. So if you can throw it into the chat, that would be great. Are we taking any more questions? Yes, yeah. Sarah, You're please Sarah. hop on. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I guess maybe on the West Coast, you guys are are replacing uh, posilins or SCMs in concrete with uh, gra fine ground glass. Um, so not the foam glass, the expanded glass gravel or you know gravel or air aggregates, but um, you know, other low embodied concrete stuff. I think the West Coast is doing a great job. So I, I'm curious if you're using that in your concrete and also if you've done like an LCA study of the two options, like a really low embodied concrete in your, in your uh, assembly. And that makes me ask, wanna ask you about the embodied carbon of um, gravel in general, like sourcing gravel. Yeah, no, good questions. Um, so, we have done some preliminary work with the EC3 uh, carbon calculator on this. Uh, we haven't had the time to complete it yet, um, but we are with the concrete we are using in this one. We're using it's a we're doing a case study with the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, and we're putting some um, some slag into the concrete, so it's dropping that embodied carbon by about fifty percent. And they're going to be doing um, this case study, and they're going to do a pretty in-depth analysis on the, uh, you know, the LCA analysis on this. So I'll be curious to see where that comes back, to see where that really, you know, uh, how that impacts it for sure. Um, so yeah, we are paying attention to that. And you're right. I mean, the gravel, just like I, I started off with too, talking about like these sand mafias and stuff like that that are, you know, because we need sand and concrete, we need gravel and concrete. Where is this coming from, and what are the impacts? You know, socially or environmentally, to how we're acquiring this, these materials. Um, yeah, so we do need to pay attention to the, the gravel that we're using. Um, if we can reduce it, if we can find alternative materials and things like that, uh, one hundred percent. I mean, um, we're doing our best to be creative and try to come up with ideas and get them out there. But um, you know, I'm not the smartest or most creative guy in the room here, um, and so. You know, uh, yeah, any of these ideas, like bring them on. We, we really got to start getting creative and finding ways to address not just this, you know, the um, operational energy, but the embodied carbon. And there's a lot of interesting stuff ha happening out there. And we just need to all just jump in and start, you know, thinking on this and trying things. Well, like cross-pollination. Totally. Sorry. Yeah, and support people who are coming up with the new products that are going to replace concrete, right? So I've seen a couple that are in product testing right now. And so it's not an admixture where you're replacing part of the concrete. Um, it's a whole new thing, right? And hopefully something that we can 3D print. <laughs> um, but Sarah, did that answer your question? Did you have any others? Yes. Um... Are you using ground glass as a replacement to a slide? Okay, um, it just see it's and it, it just seems like it would be amazing to get uh, gra gravel and, and aero aggregates. Like it seems like a, it's an urban mining idea that do you know of anybody in the West Coast that's ready to start a new company? <laughs> Yeah, maybe maybe you're that person. I don't know. I yeah. I, I, I don't. 
Um, I do think like that's, that's come up a lot here is the gravel thing and a couple times perlite yeah. and stuff like that. Like, I think these are great ideas. Um, it, here on the West Coast, we have a hard time sourcing that stuff. Certainly you could order it and then ship it all the way across the country. But I mean, there's yeah, I don't think it's a complicated carbon. manufacturing process at all. It's just heated up uh, recycled glass with, with actually CO2 uh, to expand it. And, and that's it, really. They, 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 they've, they've gone really far. I mean, originally they were importing foam glass from Europe and the, the parent company was Pittsburgh Corning and it was made in Europe. And now we have it on the East Coast. It's done by a passive house, you know, a, com a company that was really interested in passive house um, uh, to ship it to the West Coast. Yeah, it may not make a lot of sense, but uh, I think it could potentially happen. And once you ship one, two, one, two shipments over and they see that there's a market, you know, same way that we did on the West East Coast here, we were like, we know there's a market. You have to prove that it's there and you have to have some sales. So maybe we can we can somehow influence the market to make it happen there, but um, uh, it's like everything, you know. We're trickling over from from technologies from Europe here into the U.S. and now we want to manufacture really awesome technical products here. Somebody's got to invest money. They need something to put their 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 uh, back up their financing on, and I think we can all do it and 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 design it. But I really applaud. Josh, the work that you do of being a design builder, designing these things, figuring out the problems, implementing them, working as a team, integrated design. I'm like totally envious, uh, you know, because I'm just a subcontractor. The design build world in New York City hasn't really hit mainstream or culturally acceptable yet, but I'm in. I want to do it because I, 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 when I'm in the process of figuring out problems, I'm like, we can do this better, but we already priced it. <laughs> what do we do different? And uh, I envy you, man. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I'd, I'd argue that it's almost critical to doing this cost effectively and, and, and right. And in fact, I'm, uh, there will be an article coming up in Fine Home Building specifically about uh, the benefits of design build when it comes to high performance, uh, cost effective construction. Uh, awesome. Can I ask a question, please? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. Ian. Ian Robertson brought up something about a capillary break with using dimple board. And I want to call out Ian to talk about that a little bit. Are you referring to like an internal rain screen to control water vapor? That's, how do that's, you get it out? Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Like, with, you know, you put a rain screen on so that things get a place to dry. And in some ways, it's the exact same thing. but horizontally instead. And so having some sort of bubble, DITRA would be one way of getting a bubble effectively. Um, kind of makes sense. Um, one of the guys in the chat was talking about a radon thing, but that's underneath. So in this case, almost you'd want a double rain screen potentially in that case. Well, you but know, yeah. it's really cool. Yeah. If you don't mind me jumping in because Perfect. I use it, I use dimple board on the inside of masonry structures. Okay, new and old, whenever there's a remodel. So the hydrostatic, I control vertical hydrostatic pressure on masonry structures by using dimple board. And then you can insulate all you want up against it, you know, foam, rock wool, whatever, you know, and then continue that vapor path up to the roof system. But that's that's a really cool application. So I thought of you, Bob, when they were talking about this. I'm like, this is what Bob is doing on his walls. I know he's going to want to talk about this. Oh, thanks. You know, there's another job we're doing on a, on a hundred year old uh, building where there's um, a high back gutter, which means that the, the low point at the gutter is a continuous slope to the, to the front. And on top of the one by eight space sheathing, there's a combination of different uh, insulation so that I'm using dimple board with high density polyiso on top of that and then the roof membrane and then we're venting the entire roof system you know in up that to the manner. parapet at the, well the parapet but the entire flat surface of the roof system yeah. is all tied together so from behind the gutter all the way to the head but it's really cool when ian said that with the foundation it's like how would you vent it out but you'd have to go to the interior of the frame right would you go to the frame or would you do that? I think I'm going to let you guys solve that problem offline only because <laughs> okay, sorry. Sorry, it's, okay. it's nine. And I want to thank Josh and make sure that we're not taking advantage of his time. Oh, it and, is eight or two. Um, I'm sorry. And also, I want to remind people before they jump off to save the chat because there's a lot of great links in there. 
So the three little dots at the bottom where you would type in a message in the chat, you can say save chat and then you'll see a little show in window that you can click on and you can copy that file and move it where you want it to go. And uh, I highly suggest you do that. This might so, be the most active chat we've had. <laughs> I mean, it might be the longest save chat I'm gonna have to save, but uh, we really wow. appreciate everyone coming out and, and uh, Josh, great job. And Bob, Ian, everyone, thank you for participating. You guys make this show what it is and uh, innovative solutions like Josh is doing out there is what brings us here. So I'm uh, thank you all. Hey yeah, guys. Nine o'clock. Hello. Yeah, Dan. I got uh, one question. This is in 2015. And the product was about six weeks away from having its Canadian certification, but it was a, uh, it was called radon block. I just Googled that and I can't find it anymore, but what it was, was a expanded polystyrene insulation that actually was, had uh, built in studs on it. And it, what it did is it provided a ventilatable uh, space above, uh, above um, undisturbed grade. And I think you just made up a new a new building science term, a ventilatable space. I love that. Well, in fact, what it was what it was doing is it provided like about an inch space between the ground, the ground and the insulation, and the insulation was such that you didn't actually requ require any gravel, which was oh. doing the uh, the the remove the capillary uh, the need for a capillary barrier. Now, the, here's the thing: this is a great idea. Why is it not there now? That's a great question, Dan. And uh, I don't Shannon, know the can I that either. Looks like Shannon, can I, can I, <laughs> yeah, Shannon, can I butt in? That's yes, what man. I'm talking about. That's exactly what we produce here and we've been doing it 75 or 100 of them. So that's brilliant. In the, in the chat, there's a section, there's a section in there and I posted it a couple of times. Yeah, thank you. Check it out. Yeah. Okay, That's thank you. Dan. Thank you. I was late joining your meeting. Sorry. Yeah, Dan, scroll up. And Lance, feel free to pop it in there again uh, for Dan. It's, uh, it's there. And Josh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you're welcome to stay on if folks want to keep chatting. Kevin and I are probably going to call it a night in a few minutes. But really, you were fantastic. You were on point. You brought the tech. You brought the technique. You brought everything. You And you brought us your clients. So... We really appreciate you. We'd love to have you back. Great job. Great job. And great thanks job. to Thank everyone for the great questions tonight and for attending. Mm -hmm.